Hello, and welcome to Western Civ, episode 207, The Winter King. Last time, all of King Henry's well-laid plans unraveled at the unexpected death of the teenaged Prince Arthur. Suddenly, the alliance with Spain no longer seemed like a sure thing. Suddenly, Catherine was a widow. Suddenly, Prince Henry was first in line for the throne. King Henry had a lot of decisions to make, and he was not about to make them quickly. As the king of the alleged wealthiest kingdom in Europe, in an age when money bought armies, Henry's children were hot commodities, and Queen Elizabeth was pregnant again. But it was not all silver lining. The Earl of Suffolk remained at large than the Holy Roman Empire. Emperor Maximilian appeared to have no intention of turning him over any time soon. And should Prince Henry die, then Suffolk would potentially be the heir to the throne. In this episode, things change. Henry makes some major decisions, but the big story today will be Henry's descent into paranoia. Seeing conspiracies at every turn, Henry will use financial incentives and punishments to keep the nobility in line. This time he earns the nickname, the Winter King. Late in January 1503, the Queen was making her way to the Tower of London. While most people making that journey would assume it meant death, for Elizabeth the goal was life. She was eight months pregnant, and it was time for her to prepare for the birth. On February the 2nd, hardly two weeks into a confinement that was supposed to last a month, Elizabeth went into labor. The traumatic and premature labor was badly handled from the start. Elizabeth quickly became feverish. Soon, she had a raging temperature and was slipping in and out of consciousness. On February the 11th, her birthday, she died at the age of 37. Her baby daughter followed not long after. No one who knew King Henry had ever seen or heard him in such a state as he was after the news reached him that his beloved wife had died. Henry and Elizabeth had been happily married, and he looked to her as a partner with which he was building a new dynasty. Now she was gone. Eleven days later, on February the 22nd, Elizabeth was processed through London and then buried. It's hard to overstate the importance of Elizabeth of York's death. She died hardly two years after Arthur's passing. While their marriage was initially pragmatic, as I mentioned, Henry and Elizabeth did truly love each other. Or at least, that's all the evidence we get from the sources. Interestingly, their marriage was the kind that their son, Henry VIII, would spend his entire life searching for, but never finding. After Elizabeth died, the lights truly went out all over Henry VII's court. Henry became the Winter King. He would never be the same again. Beautiful and serene, Elizabeth had been the embodiment of reconciliation and forgiveness, the two virtues which had to exist as a prerequisite for the end of the Wars of the Roses. Do not forget, Henry's blood ties to the throne were tenuous at best. Elizabeth and her children were the lodestones to which many English people attached their new professions of loyalty. They were loyal to this idea 
of the union between Lancaster and York. Not so much to Henry. In life, no one ever had a bad word to say about Elizabeth, and upon her death, there was an outpouring of grief. She had been genuinely and truly loved. Elizabeth's death also dramatically impacted Prince Henry, who, up till now, had been raised as a member of the Queen's household. Now that would change, and Prince Henry would go to live with his father. It would not be all change, however. He took with him several of his humanist teachers, who would continue to look after the prince's studies. One of said teachers was none other than a young Thomas Moore, of whom we will have much more to say when we begin Henry VIII. Prince Henry's education would continue with the reassuring faces of those around him he had known since infancy. How much of this was a conscious decision by his father, I cannot say. I'm going to assume, in fact, that most of the decisions made about Prince Henry right around the time of Elizabeth's death were not made by Henry. Henry was in no position to do anything. He completely retreated from the world and isolated himself. Now, some mourning in seclusion was to be expected. But what Henry did was way beyond a couple of days of quiet seclusion. Laid low with guilt, his body betrayed him again. Henry found himself struck down, not only with debilitating mourning, but with a flare-up of tuberculosis, and for six weeks, he shut himself away. Then, he developed tonsillitis, and many around the king thought he would be following his wife to the grave in short order. Since Warbeck and Henry's first major illness in 1499, there had been intermittent talk at court about what the game plan was if the king were to, kind of, unexpectedly die. This was an easier question to answer in 1499. Back then, the Queen and Arthur were both alive. Now, four years later, all that stood between England and another round of civil war was the 12-year-old Prince Henry. After him, Suffolk and certain war. The winter of 1503 must have been a tense one around Henry's court indeed. Throughout February and March, the king slipped in and out of delirium. Finally, he emerged from his sickbed. He had not died, but dressed all in black, he was a completely changed man. He was now utterly obsessed with control. He wanted to control every aspect of his reign but he would do so behind the scenes. Most of the people who had attended Henry at court, even his closest advisors, would never see him again. From now until the end of his reign, Henry would rule through and around about a dozen trusted counselors. But he couldn't be completely alone. He still had a son to raise. The first order of business for Henry to address was the matter of the prince's betrothal to Catherine. According to representatives present, King Henry called the prince to his chambers and asked him point blank whether or not he now would consent to marry Catherine. The young man deferred to his father. Now, in reality... Both England and Spain were eager for the marriage to move forward. I mean, it had been the plan. And no one was more so than Catherine. Right now at court, she had no position, no status. If she were married to Henry, she would become, again, an English princess, with all the income that guaranteed. 
So, by June the 23rd, 1503, a new marriage treaty was signed and sealed. But, that doesn't get around the fact that Catherine had been married to Arthur. So, in order to go forward, both parties would need to seek a papal absolution. And this happens to coincide with the Borgia papacy. Hence, Henry would need to deal with Pope Alexander VI, Rodrigo Borgia, who was always willing to oblige a monarch when his interests suited. King Henry was confident. Since the beginning of his reign, he placed a premium on his relationship with Rome, as the Pope had been quick to confer legitimacy on the young Henry Tudor back in 1485. By mid-1503, English papal agents seemed well-placed to secure the necessary paperwork. Henry's main diplomat in the Vatican, Adriano Castellisi, was very confident that Pope Alexander would consent to the match and grant the absolution. And then history intervened. During the summer of 1503, with French armies again threatening Italy, Pope Alexander did indeed seem more than interested in Spanish and English support. On August the 6th, 1503, Castellisi attended a banquet in Alexander's honor, thrown by a fabulously wealthy cardinal. Whether or not Castellisi brought up the marriage, we'll never know. I think he did, but it wouldn't matter. That dinner was the last Pope Alexander ever ate. Pope Alexander and his son Cesare, as we know, became violently ill after said banquet. While rumors would persist for centuries that Alexander had mistakenly poisoned himself, it is likely that he died of malaria. In any event, his death completely upset the apple cart. Alexander's successor, Pope Pius III, died 26 days after his election. In his place came Julius II, the warrior pope, who hated anything that even remotely smacked of Borgia. Castellisi had been prepared to deal with Rodrigo Borgia, he knew how to deal with Rodrigo Borgia. Pope Julius was a different man. He would need to recalibrate. Desperate to push things forward, Ferdinand now asserted that Catherine was still a virgin. If Arthur and Catherine had not consummated their marriage, then there was nothing to be worried about. Unfortunately, the very treaty that Ferdinand and Henry had just signed stated quite plainly that the previous marriage had been consummated. That being said, Ferdinand was now insistent that Catherine was a virgin. Henry disagreed, and his reasons for doing so are pretty obvious as they were financial. According to the previous marriage contract between Arthur and Catherine, if the marriage was consummated, then Spain had to hand over the rest of her dowry, around 100,000 crowns. This would have to happen before Henry released any of her dower lands. This holdup had been why Catherine had had no income for the last year. Ferdinand's new argument was likely to muddy these already murky waters even more. But Henry had other matters on his mind. In a little over a year, all of Henry's succession plans had been scuttled. Arthur's death had been bad enough, but Elizabeth's death was potentially catastrophic. As I mentioned, many Yorkists who swore loyalty to the new regime swore to her and her children. If Henry were to remarry now and have more children, well... That might be something quite different. In theory, none of this was a problem right now, 
Prince Henry was his father's heir. He had both Lancastrian and Yorkist blood. But everyone knew, especially given Henry's poor health, just how quickly the wheel of fate might turn. The first 15 years of Henry's reign had brought peace to England for the first time consistently in around 50 years. Now it looked as though it might all unravel once more. And things were already starting to turn. Kent was quickly falling into chaos. The king's man in Kent had all but lost control. And Suffolk was only a day's sail from Kent. If he were to suddenly show up, then it seemed all but certain that the situation would collapse entirely. And Kent was not Henry's sole issue right now, not by a long shot. Even at court, there were problems with the new settlement. Two young men felt slighted, and their jilted feelings threatened to plunge the kingdom back into civil war. The first was the Duke of Buckingham, and the second, the Earl of Northumberland. Both were young men. Both of their fathers had died young as a result of the Wars of the Roses. Both men had axes to grind. Richard III had beheaded Buckingham's father. Then, in 1489, the former Earl of Northumberland was collecting King Henry VII's taxes when he was assaulted and stabbed to death by angry locals. Needless to say that both still bore serious grudges. But Buckingham and Northumberland were both minors when Henry VII came to power and their respective fathers died. That meant they both became royal wards. And if you think that Henry VII would have been a tough guy to work for, imagine what he would have been like as a guardian. While each man grew up, Henry's administrators worked hard to eat away at their estates and authority, ensuring that whatever was turned over to them as adults would be a rump version of what their fathers enjoyed. Both men felt the slight painfully. Northumberland was broodingly conscious of his family's role as great lords in a traditionally unstable northeastern England. Buckingham desperately wanted the title of Constable of England, a title Richard III had refused to give to his father. This all made what came afterward a bit of an inevitability. Each man had to go through a lengthy process to get his lands and titles back from the crown. This was called suing livery. As you can imagine, Henry was not about to give these two men anything on the cheap. For example, Henry made Buckingham pay 2,000 pounds on his mother's behalf for marrying without the king's license. And just so you're not confused, what I just said was Buckingham's mother, not Buckingham, wanted to get remarried. You know, because Richard III cut her husband's head off? And King Henry made Buckingham foot the bill for it. I don't think it's difficult to imagine just how quickly all this nickel and diming would wear on these young men. Buckingham had to borrow huge sums of money from Italian bankers just to keep Henry's wolves at bay and maintain the admittedly expensive lifestyle to which he was accustomed. Though Buckingham had the good sense to keep his mouth shut, he utterly detested Henry and his administrators. Meanwhile, in York, the problem was more immediately apparent. There, the loyal subjects of the House of Percy, those of the Earl of Northumberland, who ruled the northeast of England, began agitating for rights of their own. In 
They hated the royal officials with a burning passion. It was not uncommon at all for the streets of York to occasionally resemble the beginning of Romeo and Juliet, partisans duking it out in the public squares. This is one of those situations where another eye for another eye, and eventually everyone is blind. Revenge fueled revenge, and before long, both sides were firmly in the wrong as far as the law was concerned. Finally, on May the 23rd, 1504, the storm broke. Throughout the day, groups of the two parties had crossed each other's paths. That day, the confrontation was between the Earl and men belonging to the Archbishop of York. Said men deliberately rode between the Earl and his servants, causing Northumberland's horse to fall. He grabbed at one of the servants riding past and struck him, and suddenly... It was a melee. One of the archbishop's men leveled a crossbow at the earl, only to have another one quickly cut the string before the bolt could be loosed. Eventually, calmer heads prevailed and both sides looked apprehensively toward London, wondering what the reaction of the king might be. The king punished both with equal severity, forcing each to pay a bond of 2,000 pounds to keep the peace which they would then forfeit if they broke said peace. According to sources, Henry was livid about the affair and privately blamed the archbishop for what happened. It was just that kind of incident that had caused the death of the last Earl of Northumberland. Sadly, no one told Northumberland about Henry's apparent feelings. The incident for him was only the beginning From then on, he seemed to have tried to just see how far he could push the king, engaging in all kinds of criminality. And when the hammer blow came, it came hard. Throughout June of 1503, Henry continued to overhaul security at Calais. He badly needed men loyal to him in those key positions. Interestingly, the man he appointed to overall control was one of Prince Henry's tutors, Mountjoy. On its face, it seemed like a bad career move for Mountjoy. Calais was an isolated border settlement. Right now, he had a cushy tutoring gig. But if that were not bad enough, the cash bond Henry wanted to prove Mountjoy's loyalty was literally an insane 10,000 pounds. Moreover, Henry wanted a list of guarantors who would be bound by the same sum. So if Montjoy defected or just did something that Henry didn't like while in command at Calais, then he was potentially ruining not only his life, but the lives of all his friends. That part was not the immediate concern, though. Montjoy was well-connected, but even going to all his friends, that still left him 5,000 pounds short of the 10,000 that he needed. Keep in mind at this time, by the way, an English laborer earned around 3 pounds per year. While bonds of loyalty weren't new, what Henry was doing was completely over the top. He wanted the most extreme pledges of financial loyalty, even from men who had time and time again proven themselves. Evidently, Mountjoy was good enough to be trusted with his son's education and life, but not good enough to be trusted with Calais. Another example of this phenomenon was Giles Dobney. Dobney had lived with Henry while in exile. He had fought alongside him at Bosworth. As a reward, Henry had entrusted him with one of the fortresses at Calais. But now there were rumors that Dobney planned to install his own men in all of Calais' fortresses, with the idea that the city and its lucrative trade income would go to him. 
This rumor was, of course, absurd. These rumors should have been just dismissed out of hand. But in the court of Henry VII, this was the kind of thing that very easily got you killed. Some of Daubeny's allies even turned against him, wondering if he had perhaps been too slow to commit his troops when the Royalists were fighting James IV of Scotland during the Warbeck debacle. Again, this is crazy talk, but Henry's reign had become a nursery for this kind of backstabbing. It didn't take long for some of the other commanders in Calais to connect the dots. From Calais, the rebels could hit Kent, that hotbed of sedition. And from there, it was not a long ride to London. Interestingly, none of these rumors in the end even reached King Henry. The reason was simple. Henry had now created such a culture of mistrust and paranoia that no one knew how he would react to anything. Sure, he might reward those who brought him news of this potential coup in the making. Or he might kill the man who brought the news. So in the end, the garrisons at Calais said nothing, since that was now the only safe course. As the latest rounds of De La Pole's Confederates walked up the executioner's block in the summer of 1503, Henry was on his way to Scotland with his eldest daughter Margaret, where she would marry the Scottish king. This arrangement had been made years earlier, but health issues and not a few deaths forced Henry to delay the wedding several times. The forthcoming marriage was central to Scottish peace. Still, both Henry and his mother, the Lady Margaret, had their reservations. The princess was notoriously frail. If Prince Henry died, then the throne might pass to Margaret, and then to the Stuart kings of Scotland. And if you are wondering, yes, this is almost exactly what will happen in 100 years after the death of Elizabeth I. As Henry made his way north, news reached him of another disaster. This time it was Reynold Bray, the mastermind behind Henry's financial policies, who was dead. Of Henry's closest advisors, Bray was the man of whom he had the earliest memories, and it was probably his most trusted confidant. While Henry had been in exile, it was Bray who communicated with Lady Margaret and raised financing for Henry's invasion. Then during the early years of Henry's reign, it had been Bray's financial acumen that steadied the ship of state. His was a huge loss. According to legend, of all his advisors, only Bray could contradict the king and keep his position. With him gone, Henry was now only surrounded by yes-men. While Bray lived, all roads that led to Henry had gone through his minister. Importantly, Bray had been exactly what Henry wanted. He had no titles or independent sources of wealth outside Henry. He was completely dependent on the king. One source I read wrote that he did exactly what Henry was doing, just a little bit better. Bray was the system behind Henry's peculiar system of government. He figured out how to weaponize cash bonds in an intricate spy network. He knew how to exploit the king's prerogative rights and cut through the meandering English law courts like a hot knife through butter. He bypassed the exchequer so that funds went straight into the king's coffers. In other words, if Henry was the richest king in Europe, it was because Bray had made him that way. The actual branch of government that Bray eventually became synonymous with was the Council Learned. To be clear, the Council Learned was never officially sanctioned by law or parliament. It existed 
because Bray and Henry thought it should. The Council Learned was essentially a group of lawyers. Its membership was never fixed and tended to be flexible. That had private jurisdiction over whatever cases Henry or Bray sent its way. More often than not, the Council Learned gathered wherever Henry was and with whoever happened to be present. The methods that governed the Council Learned remain opaque today. Certainly, there was no such thing as standard civil procedure or anything remotely close to it. In other words, it was basically a private extra-legal court that Bray and Henry could use to decide any cases they wanted. And I'm assuming you can probably guess how often defendants won in such a system. Especially given that the council was consistently flooded by quote-unquote credible informant information. Henry himself never attended the council's hearings. He didn't have to. It was the perfect expression of his personal will, with Bray at its head. Bray's death, the man who probably best understood the workings of the king's mind and how this Byzantine system of quasi-law worked, left Henry in a bind. Given the various crises of the past several years, Henry wasn't inclined to listen to the will of the kingdom as a whole. Moreover, Given his endemic illnesses, he was even more withdrawn than ever before. Henry's relationship with the world around him no longer resembled what we imagine when we think of a medieval or early modern monarch. He wasn't governing with charisma. His relationship with the world had become, in essence, purely financial. Trust and handshakes had been replaced by contracts and bonds of allegiance backed up by the ever-present threat of financial penalties. Henry, after the deaths of Arthur, Elizabeth, and Bray, seemed more obsessed than ever with equating money to security. His chamber system, which no one really completely understood now other than Henry, brought him increasing amounts of cash and financial securities. We know from records that the king processed many of these accounts himself. We have whole books of receipts with notes in Henry's hand calculating the different sources from which he derived his income. We might be tempted to compare Henry VII to an Ebenezer Scrooge at this point, but that would be a mistake. He wasn't a miser. Henry was a sophisticated financial planner with an obsession for control. Henry wasn't greedy. He was never greedy. He did not covet money for its own sake. He wanted to be rich for what the money could do, for the loyalty, security, and power that it could buy. In the end, he probably just shrugged and followed Machiavelli's adage, it's better to be feared than loved more than anything else. I'm not sure you can buy loyalty in a man's heart, but I do know that Henry never did. He might have gotten compliance, and that was probably good enough for him, but it was never genuine fealty. As expected, Henry did not trust any one person enough, as he had Bray, to turn over all the dead man's responsibilities. Instead, he broke up what had been Bray's job into several. At the center, Henry now held all the strings. The first signs of the reshuffle occurred near the end of 1503, when Robert Southwell took over auditing duties, along with William Seaver, the Bishop of Carlisle. Seaver had been the equivalent of Bray in the north of England, where he worked to enforce Henry's financial plans. Under these two men, the auditing process soon hardened into another informal tribunal, with the authority to oversee 
vet, and improve accounts. If there was any evidence of corruption, then they sent the file to the council learned. For the time, however, there remained a large bray-sized hole in the heart of Henry's system. In the autumn of 1503, he filled it with Edmund Dudley, a sharp lawyer in his early 40s. Dudley had worked in London's courts and was intimately familiar with the city's workings. He knew its major avenues of power and understood the world of the London merchant. He knew how many different men evaded duties, even while the authorities vainly tried to crack down. Dudley was no lord, another factor which endeared him to Henry. He would be entirely dependent on the king, as Bray had been. Dudley once worked for Bray as a London undersheriff, investigating and enforcing royal prerogatives in his home county of Sussex. On January the 25th, 1504, Parliament convened. It would prove to be a testing ground for Dudley. It would also be the last Parliament that Henry would ever call. Henry's desire for cash had now reached new levels. He wanted to play more of a role in the developing continental power plays between Spain, France, and the Holy Roman Empire. England was never going to be able to dominate the battlefield, but it might be able to pull its own weight in cash. When English kings came to Parliament to ask for taxes, it was about as compliant as the monarch ever got. Taxation provoked widespread resentment and often unrest. It was not something any English king ever did for fun. One of Henry's more recent efforts to raise taxes nearly cost him the throne when Cornwall rebelled. For all those reasons, parliamentary taxes were generally only granted in exceptional circumstances, the defense of the kingdom or for war. If a king asked for money in other circumstances, that was tantamount to the king admitting he was a spendthrift, and you could be sure that any amount granted would come with significant strings attached. Henry's goal this time in calling Parliament was to get Parliament to support him as he sought to compel his subjects to pay an ancient tax known as the feudal aid. This was a goodwill tax, also called a benevolence. The purpose was generally for the public to foot the cost for a major event, like a wedding or a major dignitary visiting. But no king had asked Parliament to help out with expenses like this in over a century. It was technically legal, but it was a tenuous way to raise cash at best, and its repercussions were potentially massive. There was subterfuge at work here, however. Henry wanted his new tax greenlit so that he could deploy his fiscal agents in a new and even more invasive way. The commons figured out what he was after, though. It realized that if it allowed Henry in now, then there would be no way to disentangle his agents from the financial lives of everyone for some time. In true English parliamentary form, it erupted. That being said, the time was not yet nigh for the English Civil War. Henry remained too powerful and, crucially, held too many powerful Englishmen in financial bondage. Parliament eventually relented and granted Henry a tax, but not the exact tax he wanted. It agreed to grant a defense tax rather than feudal aid. Parliament was smart enough not to allow the king to let his tax dogs off the leash. For now, Parliament had slammed the door in his face. It was, for Dudley, more of a draw than a win or a loss. So it was that toward the end of March, Henry announced he would not call Parliament again, quote, for a long tract of time. Little did he realize, for him, that meant eternity. Eternity. 
For Henry, the announcement he would not call Parliament was an obvious crowd-pleasing gesture. But there was a deeper reason Henry had no intention of calling Parliament. He didn't have to. Henry had in place a system that allowed him to extract money from his subjects. If Parliament would not grant him the ability to raise money on his terms, then he would simply go around it. That June of 1504 was the hottest summer in living memory. Three months without rain. After years of bad harvests, men watched anxiously as rivers and ponds receded and dried up. It's easy to forget that the policies of kings and queens are ultimately born by common people. Nobles paid the taxes, yeah, sure. But it'd be foolhardy for one moment to think that they didn't pass those same taxes on to their subjects. Now, in an effort to alleviate some of the strain that he caused, at least on the surface, Henry dispatched royal decrees that August, giving the realm two years to present grievances to the king. If anybody felt that they had been wrongfully indebted, then they were allowed to come and present their case. Of course, they would not be allowed to present those claims directly to Henry. That wouldn't do but they could present them to one of seven named officials. The proclamation was partly pragmatic, but in the other part inspired by one of Henry's periodic fits of conscience. Henry was acutely aware in 1504-05 that his health was failing. He would soon stand before God in judgment. Perhaps it was time to atone. Yet, as was always the case with Henry, there was a flip side to his contrition. Sure, people could come and present their claims, but hidden beneath the veneer of judicial oversight was actually a far more devious plan. Henry intended to use these commissions to worm himself and his agents more firmly into society than ever before. As people presented their claims, Henry's accountants would make a full ledger of their lands and incomes, Henry's ministers would listen, understandingly, to people complaining about their local lords or neighbors, all while taking careful notes of everyone's dirty laundry. Soon, Henry would use all of it. The king was about to put in place the latest piece in his jigsaw of finance and security. On September the 11th, 1504, Edmund Dudley entered royal service as a counselor. It was a simple title, but it hid the extraordinary amount of power he had just been given. The king had made it very clear what Dudley's role was. Henry, Dudley would later write, wanted, quote, many persons in danger at his pleasure, bound to his grace for great sums of money, end quote. Dudley was to look under every rock, leave no door unopened, in his quest for legal infractions, no matter how small. The goal was to use the law to the king's advantage at every turn. The difference for Dudley was that, beyond those, he had no formal instructions and certainly no constraints. He could go wherever he wanted, do whatever he wanted. No one was untouchable. Dudley had effectively become as powerful as the king himself. So long as those account books increased in size, Henry would not question him. Dudley reported to the king, and the king alone. There was no further oversight. The list of what he looked into is nearly endless. Old debts and fines, bonds taken over years, financial penalties, long forgotten and never pursued. Dudley went over all of them and prosecuted each and every one to the absolute hilt. There was no such thing as a statute of limitations in the England of Henry VII and Edmund Dudley. From the king's office, 
Scores of boxes full of financial documents were picked up and carted off to Dudley. He set to work with the passion of a thousand sons, sifting through page upon page, looking for default judgments, suspended fines, trying to determine if anyone had broken the terms of an old bond or, you know, even if he might argue that they had. Dudley would then come to see the king. There are old stories of the two men, heads together, pouring over Dudley's books, the two of them coming up with financial penalties simultaneously. Henry would then initial each page of the ledger, the extent of the governmental oversight for Edmund Dudley. Grasping instantly what the king wanted, Dudley went out of his way to provide it by any means necessary. He was a royal servant, and he served at the king's pleasure. His career path was ultimately dependent on Henry's favor, and so Dudley became a yes-man in every way, and increasingly, that was how Henry liked it. In June 1504, Prince Henry and his retinue came to court. At the time, King Henry was based at his palace at Richmond. Turning 13 on June the 28th, Prince Henry was on the verge of manhood. As a result, things were changing. He was moving into the royal household, where he would live with the father he hardly knew. In early 1504, two years after Arthur's death, Prince Henry was formally named the Prince of Wales and heir to the throne. King Henry would keep his son close from now on. He would not repeat the mistake he made with Arthur. So he absorbed Prince Henry's household into his own. I don't want to overplay the point, however. Henry had certainly, Prince Henry that is, been at court before. He was used to the rhythms and rituals. He was not entirely wet behind the ears. Plus, as we're about to see, Prince Henry did not take after his father. He didn't want to sit behind closed doors and pore over ledgers. He loved pageantry. Still, Henry had been kept isolated with his tutors for years. At court, the young man would be exposed to all the factionalism and politicking that was increasingly invading Henry VII's royal court. Moreover, with his father's health continuing to fade, the young prince was becoming more and more the focus of said politicking. Henry had planned the timing of his son's arrival at court carefully for another reason. It was hunting season, and the extended hunting holiday allowed the king to make a tour of the realm. It was time for Prince Henry to see what he was inheriting. In doing so, King Henry and his son would travel with the royal retinue and visit with different magnates, each of which got the honor of hosting the royal party. I say honor in quotation marks because there was a lot more to these visits than meets the eye. At every manor Henry stayed at, he was there to enjoy himself, but also to take the political temperature of the region, see who showed up and who didn't. It was highly significant of Henry to take his son with him. It was time for the great men of the realm to meet the young man who, probably sooner rather than later, would be their next king. We can guess by the fact that Prince Henry came with his father, that the young man was filling out to the robust physical form for which Henry VIII would become famous. King Henry probably wouldn't have taken him with otherwise. It's easy to forget, but this is the first real time that father and son would have spent any time together. Now they were constantly in each other's company for the first time. Of course, Henry was expected to lavish attention on his son in public, but it was also a chance for him to get to know his son better. Interestingly, their situation was pretty unique. Every heir to the throne in living memory, and many more before that, had been trained in adversity, or at least in a separate household away from their parents. At an age when most young men might be expected to acquire responsibility, Henry kept his son protected and coddled. He controlled all the prince's movements, much to his chagrin. Keeping the prince close at hand, Henry VII was, belatedly, 
quote, playing the mother's part. With adolescence came a heightened emphasis on the young noble's military training, something the prince was very keen to take part in. Everything from weightlifting to running to hawking and hunting, the prince was expected to take part in activities to prepare his body for war. Prince Henry had even his own, quote, master at axes. And yes, I do wish that was still a thing. King Henry, even though he was not one for physical activity, understood the value of playing up certain chivalric virtues. He wanted his son to be the center of that, especially with the revival of that most exclusive English club of all, the Order of the Garter. The prince's coming to court did indeed seem to bring about a revival and a new vigor to court. In April 1505, King Henry elevated two young noblemen to the Order of the Garter, who would play a major role in the prince's life, Lord Henry Stafford and Richard Grey. As Prince Henry settled into life in the royal household, he looked to everyone present as the perfect model of a young prince. He was charismatic, devout, and gifted. He studied with his tutors. He sat in on council meetings. He was being molded into his father's own image. But beneath the veneer, all was not well. Prince Henry's was an extremely restricted environment. He was constantly monitored and told gently but firmly what he could and could not do. The problem is, a gap was opening up between what he was and what his father wanted him to become. The prince's coming to court that summer coincided with news from Rome. Negotiations over Catherine's dispensation for her remarriage had dragged on like water dripping from a faucet. Castellesi's plan was pretty simple. Shower Pope Julius' family with bribes and honors. Julius, however, was playing the long game. While he wrote to Henry in July of 1504 that he had every intention of taking up the matter, it was pretty clear he did not. Not, at least, until he got what he wanted. He wrote to Henry that he was delighted that he had just welcomed his nephew into the prestigious Order of the Garter and took the opportunity to name drop a few more family members who might, you know, benefit from Henry's patronage. So while Julius equivocated, King Henry was left to impatiently stew. The real victim in all this, of course, was Catherine. As I will get into more next week, Catherine was quite destitute during all this, and really got stuck with the short end of the stick. As always, if you're interested in more content, check out the website, consider becoming a patron, or check out the new subscriber feed, Western Civ 2.0. Kind of exciting. All the links are in the show notes.